Good afternoon and welcome to my lecture. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited to share this presentation with you. The word patronized can mean to give encouragement and financial support to a person, especially an artist or a cause. Patronize can also mean to treat in a way that is apparently kind or helpful, but that betrays a feeling of superiority. Female composers in Western classical music have encountered more obstacles than their male counterparts due to chauvinism, sexism, and misogyny. This lecture looks briefly at the lives and music of 11 female composers from the Baroque through the present day, the variety of ways in which they've been patronized, and the socio-historical factors unique to their respective lifetimes. These women, who are either too briefly mentioned or not acknowledged at all in music history classes, are just a small number of women composers who have been entirely overlooked or erased from history. Francesca Caccini was born into an established musical family that served the Medici family, the rulers of Tuscany. Her mother was a court soprano, and her father was the notable composer, singer, and teacher, Giulio Caccini. He ensured that Francesca had access to the best education he could provide. She was surrounded by music throughout her childhood as her father taught voice in their home, and she herself took voice lessons from him. In 1600, she performed in an opera at the Medici court, which established her as a sought-after performer in France and Italy at age 13. In addition to singing and composition, Francesca played the lute, keyboard, and guitar. After her compositional premiere in 1607, she received an official appointment with the Medici family in the women's court of Grand Duchess Christine de Lorraine. Francesca was married in the same year, arranged at Christine's behest to another court musician. Part of the reason for Francesca's success was that the Grand Duchess's court wielded considerable political influence when Christine's husband fell ill in 1607, dying in 1609, making her regent, and retaining influence when her 19-year-old son came into power. Christine remained in power after her son died in 1621 and served as dual regent with her daughter-in-law, Archduchess Maria Maddalena, until 1628. Caccini served Christine's court as a performer, composer, and teacher. Receiving patronage from the Medici's meant proximity to power, financial security, favors from the family and their wealthy guests, and the ability to have a productive musical career. However, patronage also meant giving up privacy, artistic and personal freedom, and being subjected to her patron's whims. She was treated like an object, used as a means to demonstrate her patron's wealth and power with little control over her performance or work schedule. She could be commanded to perform at any time or compose for any occasion on short notice. As a woman, Francesca had even less freedom as her fate was decided by her father, her patrons, and her husbands. After her first husband died in 1626, the Medicis arranged her marriage to a music-loving aristocrat less than a year later, and she left their service. When Francesca's second husband passed away in 1630, she had to rely on the Medicis' assistants to retain custody of her own children due to unfavorable family laws for women, and also had to rely on the Grand Duchess's favor to be reappointed at court. Nonetheless, Caccini's talent was seen as equal with her male contemporaries. She was eventually able to compose music under her own name and, for a time, earned the highest salary of any musician at court. Despite the benefits and security of patronage, Francesca was always legally obligated to someone else, whether it was her father, her husband, her duties as regent for her nobly born son, or taking care of her late husband's estates. Though prolific, few of her works survive. Her opera, La Liberazione di Ruggiero, is considered to be the first composed by a woman with two powerful female characters and was commissioned by Archduchess Maria Maddalena. With all she contributed to music at the Medici court, Francesca Caccini has earned her place in music history. For the most charming and lovely terrestrial star that today may obscure the golden rays of the sun, my heart was burning, love was laughing, desirous to observe with satisfaction my torment. 
but having mocked me, soon repented, and with her pity heals my heart. Therefore I attest for whomever does not believe it, that love alone is the God of every delight. Antonia Padovani Bembo was born into a middle-class family in Venice to parents who were supportive of her intellectual achievements. An only child, she received comprehensive education that was unusual for her socioeconomic status. Her family had no social connections to music other than those that her father cultivated in order to secure music lessons. According to her father's personal letters, she studied singing with composer Francesco Cavalli and while not documented, is likely that she studied composition with him as well. She was known as the girl who sings in Venice and Mantua. She married Lorenzo Bembo, a Venetian noble, in 1659. It was an unhappy marriage as Lorenzo fought with her father and went to war for five years, leaving her alone with three children and no financial support. She took him to court in 1672 to request a divorce for lack of support infidelity and physical abuse. However, the court ruled in favor of Lorenzo and charges were dropped. There isn't any musical activity recorded during the early years of her marriage other than a mention of musical instruments in the home. During the winter of 1666 to 1667, Antonia left Venice. She put her daughter in a nearby convent with money and jewels in exchange for her protection. Left her older sons with her husband and fled to France in the middle of the night. She had a social connection with renowned guitarist Francesco Corbetta and is hypothesized by scholars that he possibly assisted her passage to France. He may also have introduced her into musical life in Paris. However, it is unknown. Nonetheless, her opportunity to perform for Louis XIV would have been arranged by somebody she knew. Her singing earned her his favor and patronage until he died in 1715. The pension she received from her patronage gave her the financial security to live in the parish community of Notre Dame de Bonne Nouvelle with other women in similar circumstances. The situation gave her the freedom to compose and Antonia dedicated all of her works to Louis XIV, including the volumes of Produzione Armonica, from which the following piece is found. Despite having no musical connections in France when she arrived, Antonia was able to gain a foothold in musical life there. Only five volumes of her work survive. 
Italian songs, Italian style cantatas, instrumental works in opera, a grand motet, and petite motets. Many of her compositions also gave voice to female poets and other texts from a woman's point of view. Antonia figured out how to work within the rigid rules of society to firmly establish herself as a musician in two countries without assistance from a husband. Her patronage from the king was necessary in order to survive, but it also gave her the freedom to pursue, pursue music in a way that most women of her time could not. In love there needs to be boldness, O oh, my too timid heart. Chase away now, chase away fear if you long to rejoice. In amor ci volar fear, trova di meno mio amor. In amor ci volar fear, trova di meno mio amor. Scoccio mai, scoccio di amor. Jacquet de la Guerre was born into a Parisian artisan class family of master harpsichord builders, instrumentalists, teachers, and singers. Though not ranking high in the Baroque hierarchy of musicians, master harpsichord builders were well compensated and her family was well connected with other composers, publishers, and performers through their family tree and social circles. Women could pursue music professionally at this time in France, but performance opportunities were limited to harpsichord, organ, and voice, and women were excluded from holding official chapel positions. Jacques de la Guerre's parents encouraged the musical talents of their four children, all of whom had professional music careers. She performed frequently from an early age, and her talent for singing and playing the harpsichord caught the attention of Louis XIV, earning his support and patronage. She dedicated all of her music to him from 1670 until his death in 1715. Under his patronage prior to her marriage, she lived at court in Versailles under the protection of Louis's mistress, Madame de Montespan, and was provided education, performance opportunities, was encouraged for her compositions, and given rights to publish music under her own name, which patrons did not always allow. Though there is documentation that her earliest compositions were performed at court, none are known to survive. Jacques de la Guerre was not listed officially as a court musician during Louis XIV's reign, which was common for female musicians under his mistress's wing. She wasn't given an official court appointment until 1723 by Philippe Duc d'Orléans. In 1684, keeping with family tradition, she married Marin de la Guerre, an organist and harpsichordist within her family's social circle, who also encouraged her musical success. Upon marrying, she returned to Paris to live with her husband. She continued her relationship with the royal court and her music was still performed in aristocratic circles after marriage. At the same time, music was becoming more accessible to the Parisian bourgeoisie, creating demand for public concerts and an increasing number of salons. This presented plenty of performance opportunities for her, and she was in high demand, particularly for her improvisational skills. Her own salon also attracted a large audience. Meanwhile, she continued to compose. These circumstances ensured that her career actually gained momentum after she got married and even after she had a child, which was unusual for women of her time. She was the first female composer to publish an opera in France and the first woman to have an opera performed at the Académie Royale de Musique in 1694. In 1704, her son and husband died within months of one another. After her husband's death, she was able to support herself through teaching and performing and family money. 
It was around this time that she began composing cantatas, which gained popularity in France around 1700. She incorporated the Italian musical style while following the tradition of alternating airs and recits and the use of allegorical emotional expression. Jacques de la Guerre was the first woman in France to publish cantatas in 1708, hers being considered the earliest examples of French sacred solo cantatas. After Louis XIV died, she took on a new patron, Maximilian II of Bavaria, and dedicated her third and final book of cantatas to him. She gradually retreated from public life, publishing her last known pieces in 1724. She received acclaim in her lifetime and was even given a longer article than Francois Couperin in Johann, Johann Walter's Musicalisches Lexicon and received posthumous recognition in scholar Titon du Tillet's La Pranasse Francois. Although most women in France could have musical, professional musical careers at this time, they could not hold the most prestigious court or church appointments and were excluded from conservatories and choir schools. However, Elisabeth Claude Jacquet de la Guerre had the talent, support, and right circumstances under which her career was able to flourish. Israel, for whom heaven wanted to break the bondage, fled far from the sad servitude of the tyrant, but upon looking at the sea, he feels his uncertainty revive. Moses already hears some new murmurings. Did you have to lead us to these frightful depths? In Egypt for her victims, had she lacked tombs? Ungrateful ones, if only your complaints would cease, take again a sweeter hope. There is a supreme power whom the waves obey. He arms himself for your aid. The parting waters are going to teach you that the hands that ruled their course has the power to stop them. Israel,
Anna Amalia was born into an aristocratic family with a tradition of musical study. Through her uncle, Frederick II, better known as Frederick the Great, came an appreciation for music. He was forbidden to study music by his father, Frederick I, a practice flute in secret. When Frederick II came into power, he encouraged the musical education of his children and siblings, which included his sister, Anna Amalia's mother. Anna Amalia's parents, Princess Philippine Charlotte and Duke Carl I, supported her education, giving her the same level of instruction as her brothers, which included law, theology, writing, French, music, art, and history, among others. Her first music teacher was court musician Friedrich Gottlob Fleischer, who taught her composition, clavichord, lute, and harp. Anna Amalia became Herzogin von Sachsen Weimar Eisenach in 1756, when she married Ernst Augustus II, who was also learned in music. He died in 1758, just before her 19th birthday, making her a widow, regent, and new mother of their second child. Ernst Augustus thought highly of Anna Amalia and left her sole custody of their oldest son, making her regent of the duchy until he came of age in 1775. Under her rule, Anna Amalia revitalized Weimar as a prominent political and cultural center. She provided weekly public performances of plays, music, and ballet, and nearly everyone in her court participated in composing and learning music for court performances. Johann Ernst Bach, who was Johann Sebastian's nephew, was court musician until 1758, and Anna Amalia hired court musicians to create works and teach her sons. She also hired soprano and, compo and composer Corona Schröter to be the court Kammersängerin, or chamber musician. Once she became the Dower Duchess, she hosted salons in her private residence. Due to her status as a widow and role as a regent, typically a masculine role, her true duty of producing an heir for the duchy was fulfilled, and she was able to defy societal expectations of women without worry of risking her reputation. She created her image as a composer subtly through commissioned portraits, depicting herself sitting with a flute, likely a tribute to her powerful uncle, and an instrument limited to men at the time, because women could only play instruments that didn't change their posture or disturb their beauty. She also commissioned, commissioned a portrait of herself sitting at a double harpsichord with music on the stand, an instrument only for serious composers. It was believed that women were too emotional to possess creative power to compose, and that they were only capable of imitating men, but Anna Amalia challenged that notion. Her teacher, Ernst Wolf, described her as a kenner, a knowledgeable serious music musician. She composed solo keyboard works, concertos, art songs, oratorios, and cantatas, forms which were unusual for women who managed to compose. However, her comprehensive education gave her the ability to do so. She also composed the music for the Zingspiel Erwin und Elmira with Goethe as a librettist. She received public recognition for her compositions within her lifetime, and her music was known outside of Weimar. When she died in 1807, the citizens of Weimar mourned her death, leaving a lasting positive impact on the cultural, political, and social fabric there. She also left behind a monumental music collection with the creation of the Anna Amalia Bibliothek. In the country and the city, one is plagued by futility. For the little that one has, one must struggle with one's neighbors. All around God's earth is hunger, toil, and envy, enough to drive one out. Yet earthly torment is no torment, but to the cowardly and dull. Work gives us our daily bread, our roof and plot and shade. All around where God's sun shines, you find a maiden, you find a friend. Let us remain here forever.
Maria Szymanowska was a Polish pianist and composer who believed the mission of the performer was creative freedom. Born into a well-to-do Warsaw family, her parents hosted a well-attended salon, immersing her in music during childhood and providing her earliest performance opportunities. Warsaw was a popular stop for touring musicians en route to Russia, so she heard many compositional styles of the day and observed informal lessons with some of the finest musicians. She was one of the first professional piano virtuosos as the technical capabilities of the instrument were still being explored. She toured Europe extensively and was also one of the first virtuosos to play from memory. Her musical studies are uncertain, but is likely she studied composition with Josef Elsner, who was good friends with her parents and mentioned in his personal letters. He would later become Chopin's composition teacher. It is also agreed by scholars that Szymanowska good, Sh Szymanowska's good friend, Irish pianist and composer John Field, had a significant influence on her compositional style. She married landowner Józef Szymanowski in 1810 after she was already an established performer. In 1820, he requested a divorce. Szymanowska wanted to continue her concert career while her husband disapproved. Though the years of her marriage slowed down her musical activity, they were still productive. She continued to compose and played private concerts. In 1818, she resumed touring and went on to tour in Russia, France, London, Italy, and Poland before settling down in St. Petersburg in 1828. In 1820, the publishing house Breitkopf und Hertel published seven volumes of her works. She later published her music with several other publishing houses, which was a lucrative endeavor. After her divorce, she retained custody of her children who stayed with her mother when she toured and was able to support her family through performing, teaching, and royalties from her compositions. In 1822, she was the first woman to receive an appointment as court pianist for the Tsarist Court of Russia. This appointment was politically beneficial for the Tsarist Court as it helped solidify relations between East and West and provided Shimonovska with means to support her family. She was very well respected and living composers whose work she performed dedicated compositions to her in return, which included John Field and Luigi Cherubini. She also befriended Goethe, who dedicated his poem Auszunung to her. She composed approximately 113 works, including chamber music, concert etudes, nocturnes, and art songs, which are considered to be the birth of Polish art song. Szymanowska was among the first to use Polish dance forms in art music and is regarded as a predecessor to Chopin both as a pianist and as a composer. Robert Schumann stated in his essay on Szymanowska, if we should praise women highly when they only play etudes, we ought to do even more when they write them. However, these are really good and improving, especially for studying figuration, ornaments, and rhythm. If we detect the uncertain woman in form and harmony, we find also the woman full of feeling who has much more to say if she only knew how. If I could tell, O oh God, the extremes of my sorrow, I would awaken in your heart a small sign of mercy. Perhaps then, made compassionate, you would show to me, I hope, a tempting glimpse of my happiness.
sguardo lusinghiero della mia felicità. Uno sguardo lusinghiero della mia felicità. Della mia felicità. Pauline Viardot, soprano composer, pianist, and teacher, was born into a prominent Spanish musical family but was born and raised in France. Her father was Manuel de Populo Garcia, prominent tenor, composer, and singing teacher, and her mother was Joaquina Siches, an actress and singer. Her older brother was Manuel Patricio Rodriguez Garcia, the father of modern vocal pedagogy. It was never a question that she would become a musician. She began piano lessons at age four, adhering to her father's strict lesson and practice schedule. She observed her father's voice lessons and performances as a young girl and began accompanying his voice students at age eight. She heard and met elite musicians and composers in her parents' well-attended salon. Early in her childhood, the Garcia family spent time in the United States, Mexico, and all over Europe, which exposed her to new musical styles, and she became fluent in five languages. Viardot aspired to be a concert pianist and studied with Marcos Vega and Franz Liszt. However, when her older sister celebrated soprano Maria Malibran died expectedly in 1836, Pauline was instructed to give up piano and began voice lessons with her mother, as her father had passed away four years prior. Viardot's mother and brother-in-law, husband of the late Maria Malibran, prepared her to tour and acted as her escorts and managers. She toured all over Europe to great success, performing in salons, concerts, and performing countless opera roles. She rubbed elbows with wealthy patrons and the who's who of the European cultural scene, including Rossini, Gounod, Clara Schumann, Berlioz, Chopin, writer George Sand, painter Ari Scheffer, Brahms, and Tchaikovsky, to name a few. In 1840, at age 18, Pauline married Louis Viardot, attorney, author, and director of Théâtre Italien. He supported her career financially and acted as her manager, but gradually gave her increased freedom to choose her schedule and even travel alone, in spite of having four children. Although she had quite a busy schedule, Pauline found time to compose. She composed while she was pregnant, during summers in between opera seasons, and especially after moving to Baden-Baden, upon retiring from stage in 1863. After composing a particularly successful operetta, Viardot's friends and colleagues offered commissions for her work, but she was wary of losing the joy she found in composing and declined. She continued to compose for her own pleasure and for her friends, and was so well connected that there was no shortage of performance opportunities for her pieces. Pauline was published within her lifetime in several countries and her works were translated to multiple languages. She composed about 250 compositions, including art songs, choral works, operettas, folk song arrangements, vocal arrangements of instrumental works, and piano reductions. Part of her success was her ability to balance her career with the appearance of conforming to social expectations for a woman of her time, marrying young and having children. She maintained a respectable reputation due to her insistence upon being billed as Madame Viardot in programs and concert posters, which presented her as a wife before a performer and as her husband's property. The other part of her success was her immense talent, fortunate family connections, and steadfast work ethic. She fell into obscurity after she died, but there has been a recent revival of interest in her life and work. Oh, if it is true that at night when the living are at rest, and from the moonlit sky the rays glide among gravestones, oh, if it is true that then the quiet graves are emptied, I call to a shade, I wait for Layla. Toward me, my beloved, come here, come here. Appear, beloved shade, as you were before the separation, pale, cold as a winter day, distorted by the last torment. Come as a distant star, as a light sound or breath, or as a horrible vision. It is all the same to me. Come here, come here. I call you not in order to reproach people whose malevolence killed my beloved, nor to make visible the secrets of the grave, 
nor that which sometimes torments myself with doubt, but, with longing, I want to say that I love still, I am still yours. Come here, come here. Marcy Cheney Beach was born into a family of modest means in New Hampshire, grew up in Boston, and was surrounded by music from birth. Her mother sang and played piano, and her grandmother sang in church choir and at home. Amy's talent for music was apparent very early, as she could hum 40 tunes in the same key she heard them in by age one. Her parents later discovered she had perfect pitch and synesthesia, the ability to see pitches and keys as colors. With a career spanning from the Victorian era through most of World War II, she was a trailblazer for women in the field of composition. She was the first American woman to compose a symphony and a mass, which was significant due to the openly negative attitude towards female composers. As in prior generations, the attitude that women were intellectually incapable of creating still prevailed, and those genres were considered very masculine. She was hailed as a piano prodigy, and despite her parents' attempts to downplay her talent and purposely limiting her time at the piano, Amy played in private recitals and salons from age seven among the best musicians in Boston. At this time, there was much interest in cultivating local talent, so she was well known. She made her public recital debut at the age of 16 in Boston's main music hall and had her professional debut with the Boston Symphony Orchestra at the age of 17. Her parents did not support a professional concert career beyond that. They didn't think it was a proper life for a girl and had only allowed it to help attract a suitor. Between her debut and marriage, Amy wanted to seriously pursue composition. She took one year of harmony, after which her parents met with a composition teacher, Wilhelm Garica, who recommended that the best course of action 
was for her to teach herself from the great masters. At age 18, Amy married Dr. Henry Harris Aubrey Beach, 24 years her senior and the same age as her parents. Despite his admiration of her musical talent, he also did not support a performance career, holding on to the ingrained beliefs of his generation. Additionally, there was a stigma attached to women who traveled alone, which she would have had to do because her husband, being a physician, was not able to take leave from work and was unwilling to give up his career to tour with her. There was also a stipulation in their marriage agreement that she could only perform one to two times per year and had to donate her professional fees to charity. He built her a home studio for composition and practicing, but did not encourage formal compositional study. Her studio also conveniently kept her away from the public eye. After her marriage, she was very careful that her name always appeared as Mrs. H.H.A. Beach in publications and concert programs. This presented her image as a wife belonging to her husband before being a performer. Like Pauline Viado, she was aware of social pressure to balance her professional ambitions while preserving a respectable reputation because any perceived character flaw would have been a major setback. Despite the lack of formal compositional training, her early compositions were published in 1885 by Arthur P. Schmidt, who was dedicated to promoting local composers. The publishing house continued to publish everything she wrote until 1914, which helped encourage performances of her work, earning a well-deserved place among respected composers. After her husband died in 1911, Beach resumed performing, established herself professionally in Europe, and continued to compose until 1942, when heart disease made her too weak to work. She wrote approximately 300 works. Sweet, 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 oh happy that I am. Listen to the meadow larks across the fields that sing. Sweet, 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 oh subtle breath of balm. Oh winds that blow, oh buds that grow, oh rapture of the spring. Sweet, 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 who prates of care and pain. Who says that life is sorrowful? O oh, life so glad, so fleet. Ah, he who lives the noblest life finds the noblest gain. The tears of a pain, a tender rain to make its waters sweet. Sweet, 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 O oh, happy world that is. Dear heart, I hear across the fields my maidling pipe and call. Sweet, 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 O oh, world so full of bliss. For life is love, the world is love, and love is over all.
Germaine Taillefer was born Germaine Taillefes and began piano studies with her mother at age four and attempted to write her first opera at age five. Her father strongly discouraged her study of music as he equated it to prostitution and was physically abusive. With the help of her mother, she secretly entered the Paris Conservatoire at 12 years old against his wishes and became a top student in piano and composition, winning numerous awards during her studies there. Her father refused to provide financial support, but flaunted newspaper blurbs announcing her awards at the conservatory. She later changed her name to Taillefer out of resentment towards him. It was at the conservatory in 1912 where she met her colleagues and friends, Darius Mio, Georges Auric, and Arthur Oniger, who later formed part of the group known as Les Six. She met Francis Poulenc and Louis Dury in 1918 when their pieces were featured on a concert together. Her association with Les Six was notable and unfortunately, being the only female member has defined her portrayal in most history books, if even mentioned. Reviews of her concerts in Paris contained patronizing statements, statements such as calling her a young girl at age 28, comparing her to a child, calling her work pretty and quaint and comments about how she was the best-looking member of Les Six. Critic Paul Rosenfeld wrote of Taillefer in an article on Les Six. Her talent is very frail, and her inclusion in the group must be attributed chiefly to a fine enthusiasm for the sex on the part of the five male members. However, she was successful in her own right and respected among her peers. In 1926, she married Ralph Barton, an American cartoonist, Having had professional success prior to marriage, she found that her creativity was stifled because he wouldn't let her play or compose at home, objecting to the noise. She survived a traumatic incident when, upon finding out she was pregnant, Ralph tried to shoot her in the abdominal area with intent to harm the baby. Taillefer ran out of their home, hid in the bushes, and escaped to safety at a friend's house nearby. She suffered a miscarriage after that, and when her husband heard the news from New York, he had flowers sent to the clinic where she was recovering to congratulate her on the miscarriage. They never saw each other again. The miscarriage occurred in June 1929, and she composed her cycle Six Chansons Françaises, from which the following piece is from, in August of the same year. The poetry depicts the struggles of women, especially affairs of the heart. This may have been a response to the trauma she endured, as well as an outpouring of ideas that had been suppressed while she was married. Taillefer married again in 1932 to a French lawyer with whom she had a daughter. He also discouraged her work, going as far to purposely splatter ink on her scores and physical abuse. They separated, eventually divorcing in 1955. After World War II, Taillefer continued to compose on commission for film, concert halls and radio for all types of instrumentation. <laughs> as the years went on, work became less and she started teaching accompaniment at a private school in Paris, where the children were in awe that she was famous enough to be in a musical dictionary. Her last work was Concerto de la Fidelité, premiered at the Paris Opera with Arlene Auger in 1982, and she continued to compose until a few weeks before her death in 1983. She wrote over, over 200 compositions. 
No, fidelity has never been anything but stupidity. Capriciously, I've left more than one beautiful woman. Long live novelty. But morality, you say? Puerility. Repeated vows? Out of fashion. Could one ever count on a treatise inspired by pleasure that omits the value of freedom? You pretend out of vanity to be annoyed. The unregretted lover is copied by others. The woman, for her part, gaily quickly makes alternative arrangements. Undine S. Moore, pianist, professor, and composer, was born in rural Virginia to parents whose own parents had been enslaved. Education and music were highly valued in her home and started taking piano lessons at age seven. The spirituals her parents sang to her had a great influence on her later in life. Moore was also active with music through her church and grew up in a black community with a strong tradition of musical education. A common question asked of all children in town was whether they'd learned to read sheet music yet. On her childhood, Moore stated, to live in a society where one's favorite art is highly regarded, highly valued, where one's progress is a source of pride to the family and the entire community is enough to create in a child a fine sense of self-worth and a high level of aspiration. She studied piano at Fisk University where the composition professor encouraged her and her first compositions were performed. She graduated cum laude in 1926 and started teaching piano and organ at Virginia State College in 1927, where she taught for 45 years. She also taught theory, where she used her own unpublished workbook, which used examples from Western classical composers and black composers. From 1929 to 1931, she completed graduate studies and her professional diploma in music at Columbia. Though the Harlem Renaissance had not been named yet. Undine lived within it during her years at Fisk and studies at Columbia, and it deeply influenced her. She started composing again when she was unexpectedly put in charge of the choruses at Virginia State College and didn't have a budget to purchase music. She had to compose on short notice, but this gave her the chance to compose pieces that fit the voices in the choirs and highlighted her group's strengths. She married Dr. James Arthur Moore in 1938, another professor at Virginia State who was a skilled tenor and supported her music career, giving her freedom that other wives in her generation didn't have. From 1952 to 1953, she studied composition with Howard Murphy at the Manhattan School of Music. Moore encountered her fair share of challenges due to race and gender. In the book, From Spirituals to Symphonies, African-American Com African-American Women Composers and Their Music by Helen Walker Hill, Moore was quoted, one of the most evil effects of racism in my time was the limits it placed upon the aspirations of blacks so that though I have been making up and creating music all my life, in my childhood or even in college, I would not have thought of calling myself a composer or aspiring to be one. On being a woman, Undine observed that while women held positions of power in her childhood community, there was an unspoken understanding that their influence was limited. She states further, so far as I know, the influence of women on music and the culture in the life of the black community, while known and applauded, was rarely, if ever documented in any written form. Moore also helped create and co-direct the Black Music Center at Virginia State to champion Black composers and their musical heritage. Both Virginia State and Indiana University gave her honorary doctorates and was named Musical Laureate by the State of Virginia. 
She composed over 100 works in her lifetime. Her piece, Scenes from the Life of a Martyr, a 16-part oratorio on the life of Dr. Martin Luther King, was premiered in Carnegie Hall and nominated for a Pulitzer Prize, and she received the Virginia Governor's Award in the Arts in 1985. Love, let the wind cry on the dark mountain, bending the ash trees and the tall hemlocks with the great voice of thunderous legions, how I adore thee. Let the hoarse torrent in the blue canyon, murmuring mightily out of the gray mist of primal chaos, cease not proclaiming, how I adore thee. Let the long rhythm of crunching rollers breaking and bursting on the white seaboard tighten and tireless, tell while the world stands how I adore thee. Love, let the clear call of the tree cricket, frailest of creatures, green as the young grass, mark with its trilling resonant bell note how I adore thee. But more than all sounds, surer, serener, fuller of passion and exultation, let the hushed whisper in thine own heart say how I adore thee. Silver is a composer with roots in the Pacific Northwest and was born in Seattle, Washington. She started piano lessons at age five, was active in her synagogue, and began her undergraduate studies in piano. Midway through, she decided to switch to composition and graduated from the University of California at Berkeley. Her study of composition almost stopped before it started, however, because a professor in her undergraduate program strongly discouraged her from signing up for a composition seminar, telling her, girls don't compose. It was a good thing she didn't listen. After graduation from her master's program, she received the prestigious George Ladd Prix de Paris to study composition in Europe for two years, where she studied with Erhard Karkoschka and Georgi Ligeti. She earned a doctorate from Brandeis and taught at New York State University at Stony Brook. Over her career, Sheila has won numerous grants and fellowships for her work that have allowed her to travel and study new modes of composition. And her works have been performed all over the United States. She has composed orchestral works, art song, film scores, string quartets, and operas. One of her recent opera commissions with Seattle Opera called A Thousand Splendid Sons is scheduled to premiere in 2022, having been rescheduled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Despite the success and acclaim she has achieved, 
Sheila has stated that systemic gender inequality issues still exist in the framework of classical composition. While circumstances have improved since she was originally discouraged from pursuing composition during her undergraduate years, it is still primarily men who sit on boards and hold positions of power in music organizations. The following piece, Thursday, comes from the song cycle Beauty Intolerable, which sets the poetry of Edna Vincent Millay celebrating the femme fatale. And if I loved you Wednesday, well, what is that to you? I do not love you Thursday, so much is true. And why you come complaining is more than I can see. I loved you Wednesday, yes, but what is that to me? Hall grew up in Eastern Ohio. Her mother was a pianist and started teaching her piano at age six, while her grandparents exposed her to poetry and folk music. Juliana was also active in music through her church, where she sang and played piano. She wrote her first composition at age 13 for her church choir friends, for flute, children's choir, piano, and narrator. She studied piano at Cincinnati Conservatory of Music, finishing her degree at the University of Louisville and moved to New York where she continued piano studies and sang in the choir at Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church. She attended graduate school at Yale where she was encouraged to switch from piano performance to composition. Juliana went on to study with Dominic Argento in Minneapolis after graduate school and received her first commission from the Schubert Club for soprano Don Upshaw. After 1989, she moved back to the East Coast, married and raised a family, and though she continued to compose, professional life was quiet for her during those years. In 2013, she and her husband built a website, self-published her compositions, and found that her music had been performed often during those quiet years. Juliana has been an active and prolific composer, receiving numerous awards, grants, and commissions, and has composed more than 300 songs, including 60 song cycles. She is also serving as a mentor in the new Nats Mentorship Program for Composers. In an email interview, she states, I have never knowingly been treated differently in a negative sense from others because of my gender, except because I'm a woman, I have benefited greatly in a more positive sense from living during a time when so many performers and presenters wish to include music by women composers on their programs. She has felt supported and not patronized in her career, which is a circumstance that we can hope will apply to composers of all genders and backgrounds. My head's in a whirl. I really don't know where to begin. 10 o'clock, footsteps on the stairs. Lights out. Tiptoe upstairs. We're expecting the police. The lights were switched off. Think of it, having to sit in terror for a day and two nights. We thought of nothing but simply sat there in pitch darkness. 
We whispered, and every time we heard a creak, someone said, shh, shh. It was 10.30, then 11. Then, at 11.15, footsteps in the house, the private office, the kitchen, then on the staircase. All sounds of breathing stopped, eight, eight hearts pounded. Footsteps on the stairs, then a rattling at the bookcase, and the footsteps receded. None of us have ever been in such danger as we were that night. God was truly watching over us. Once again, we were spared. We've been saved. Keep on saving us. That's all we can say. My head's in a whirl. I really don't know where to begin. Ten o'clock Footsteps on the stairs Lights out Tiptoe upstairs We're expecting the police! Steps receded. 
Each of these women learned to succeed within the patriarchal societies to which they were subjected, carving out meaningful music careers and leaving behind a wealth of music. Dr. Anna Beer states in her book, Sounds and Sweet Airs, The Forgotten Women of Classical Music, they did not seek out or seek to create a female tradition, nor did they wait for a female teacher or mentor. They invariably worked with and within a male-dominated musical culture. The alignment of talent, socio-historical circumstances, and social status made each of these incredible composers uniquely suited to succeed during their lifetimes. This issue of exclusion from music history is unfortunately still a systemic issue in Western classical music. While it has come a long way, there is room for improvement. We can all work towards inclusivity by studying and performing music by composers in non-dominant groups, recognizing the music by merit, and working towards patron patronage without patronization. Thank you so much for coming today and for sharing the music with me.